Hello and welcome to this episode of the Cyclo Edition, the podcast for those looking to go above and beyond in their understanding of organic literature. I'm Grace Latowski and I am joined today by Matt Genzing and Wesley Swords. The paper we will be discussing is titled Hydro Dialkinative Carbon SB3 Carbon SB2 Bond Fragmentation by the group of Oyun Kwan, who is a full professor at UCLA. Her group focuses on expanding the utility of phosphine catalysis. The paper we are discussing today showcases a method to fragment vinyl carbon-carbon bonds to obtain optically pure, synthetically useful molecules. So the overarching goal of this paper is a fragmentation reaction in which the group takes an alkene, undergoes an otosanalysis reaction. They then reduce um, the peroxide to give you an oxygen radical that can then cleave off what was the CSP2 carbon, leaving you with an alkyl radical. Then after hydrogen atom transfer, you're left with an alkylated product, which you have lost the alkene uh, functional group. And so overall, they call this reaction hydrodealkenylation in kind of respect to hydrodealkylation, which is more likely thought of as the um, CSP3 loss from toluene to give you benzene. Yeah, so this idea of fragmentation or deconstruction is kind of interesting in the context of total synthesis and total synthesis strategies. Going back to 1975 and even earlier, these ideas of strategies in total synthesis have been kind of fleshed out. Hendrickson had this big paper in 1975 where he kind of starts talking about these strategies, and he really stresses the fact that in creating a complex molecule, the goal is to have a sequence of only construction reactions involving no intermediary refunctionalizations and leading directly to the target. Right. The goal of any total synthesis project would be if you can start with the simplest you know, material you can buy at the cheapest cost possible and then go straight from that very simple project to a very complex, most likely chiral, optically active you know, natural product without, any, without the need to functionalize anywhere, to, de- to protect or deprotect, and just completely build complexity every step of the way. Phil Barron even goes as far as to quantify this ideality. So he even has this equation where he has the number of construction steps plus the number of strategic redox steps over the total steps is like your percent ideality, which is interesting in the context of this paper because this is deconstruction where ideal is considered as construction. Well, I think this idea is even so important or this has been stressed from coming back to all those reviews that they wrote about many years ago, but even showing up this past year, like Matt and I were in a synthesis course at UW-Madison, and on the first day they told us all about your ideal synthesis and the path that you should take to plan your route. And so on the first day, um, our professor drew up a plot of complexity versus the number of steps. And so the ideal case is just showing a completely linear line. And so that's showing that in every step that you take, you increase complexity. Another pathway that you could think about taking is building complexity and then doing a couple of functional group interconversions where you have then a horizontal line and building complexity then in your next step, a couple of inter- functional group interconversions, and so on until you get to your product. Like Matt stated with the Perrin paper, this is just not ideal, but it also works. Well, in, in, in many cases, you'll have functional groups that you've placed into the molecule and that are needed in your, your, your final molecule that you can't do certain reactions on without protecting them. So it becomes a case where sometimes you have to protect groups and deprotect groups. And so those lines are not thought of as increasing and then like decreasing complexity. It's more of just a single horizontal step in which you're able to maintain the complexity that you have and then move forward with extended complexity. So thinking about this strategy, we are starting with highly complex molecules and decreasing complexity, so going backwards, and then building up your complexity in the next um, step. So that was just kind of eye-opening to see a strategy that when, when you learn, I guess, in like the first day of synthesis, that you should always be trying to move forward when building complexity. I think this is also kind of counterintuitive, especially from a historical perspective, because the way that total synthesis was done maybe 50 or 100 years ago is you'd have your target molecule, and then basically you'd see the starting materials that were available to you, and you'd just kind of try to match the structures and see what was closest, and then basically start with that starting material, and kind of like what you were saying, Grace, take horizontal steps in complexity, not really necessarily gaining complexity, but just like altering your starting materials to the product 
And with retrosynthetic analysis, you know, that kind of has gone away a little bit. But I think this paper shows that there are still portions of that strategy that can be really effective. I think the key into why this strategy works for these molecules is they're starting from um, these terpene starting materials, which are naturally abundant. So they're everywhere and easily isolated, and they're just good materials to start with, but they have a certain amount of complexity built into them already. And being able to piece off like a fragment of them will become way more useful down the line. Yeah, well, and just, and just thinking about these terpene materials, many, many, many of them can be purchased for you know cents per gram, which makes them readily available. And so now when you think about you know, the way that you might approach a total synthetic problem starting with a terpene, if you can have all the complexity that you need already generated in a naturally occurring molecule, do a disconnection, and then maybe a few more complexity building steps, and it saves you thousands of dollars, you'd much rather prefer to lose a bit of complexity in the initial step, but gain it further on without the need of starting with materials that you can't either synthesize presently or just don't need to synthesize due to the cost. I think just to clarify, when we're talking about complexity in these molecules, a lot of them are starting out like already chiral. Um, so you can start with a chiral reagent and go on and continue your synthesis there. And so that's really helpful because then that can direct other groups that you're adding on and set other stereo centers. If we want to just take kind of one aside, in the idea of total synthesis, there's two methods that you can start with. You can either start with achiral materials that are, you know, have no or optical activity. They're, you know, and then you have to build that in yourself through an antioselective reactions when you need them. Or you can start with molecules that we say come out of the chiral pool, which is just naturally occurring molecules or molecules that are very, very cheap to synthesize an antioselective and then start there and begin with an already optically active compound and build complexity off of it. Before, I think many people have been using these terpenes as molecules in the chiral pool, but featuring their syntheses around them. Um, so they would have to functionalize this alkene and then somehow get rid of it if they wanted to, or else put it into their molecule at some point um, and like use that functionality. But with this method, you're able to cleave that and just start with kind of the piece that matters. <laughs> Well, you're able to like map it onto many more structures. You can yeah. map it onto structures in which everything else matches, but you just don't need the alkene. So you can either build up to that point and then cleave it off, or if you just want, if you can, just cleave it off in the beginning. If you can do a, rel a relatively cheap deconstruction to build up a lot, you know, to not have to then build up a lot of complexity yourself, it'll be very useful going forward. So even though most of the reactions that come out in the chemical literature are focused on these constructive strategies, there still are some um, really notable deconstructive strategies, some of which being really common reactions. The ones that come to mind initially, especially when thinking of sp2, sp2 linkages, um, first one being ozonalysis, which we touched on briefly and which is used in this paper, but basically that just cleaves an alkene into two separate carbonyls. And then the other one that's more recent, but just as useful as olefin metathesis, cleaving an alkene and kind of rearranging the alkene substituents. If we jump now to carbon heteroatom bonds, um, there are methods to deconstruct these bonds. Two that come to mind that have been used in methods to build complexity are um, work by uh, Richmond Sarpong, in which he looked at activating carbon nitrogen bonds. Um, and kind of just one example is the ability to activate proline and cleave that CN bond to then build complexity through either chlorination or halogenation, and then the ability to couple with those um, halogens. And um, in a related work, Christina White also has looked at the activation of CN bonds and proline. Um, as a means to kind of, at the end of complex syntheses of, of polyamino acids, cleave those bonds to then build functional group complexity in these molecules. So now looking at each step of the mechanism kind of in detail, and just as a warning, it might get a little bit technical here. Um, so if you're listening on the podcast, you may want to switch over to YouTube where we have drawings. So just a plug for Grace's drawings there. Um, <laughs> So basically the first step here is ozonalysis. Start with an alkene and ozone. That undergoes uh, a 1,3 cycloaddition to give a 
five membered intermediate ring and then there's a retro one three cyclo addition to give two different fragments one being a carbonyl the other being a carbonyl oxide in the ozonolysis mechanism that most people are familiar with this goes on to form two different carbonyl containing compounds but the difference here is that if this reaction is done in the presence of an alcohol that alcohol can act as a nucleophile to the electrophilic carbonyl oxide and can form this intermediate known as an alpha alkoxy hydroperoxide. Right, and so this is step one of the author's hydrodealkenylation reaction. They take this hydroperoxy hemiacetal then and um, add in a hydrogen atom donor and then to this reaction mixture of the peroxide and the hydrogen atom donor, they then add in dropwise iron two sulfate. The iron two can reduce the peroxide and you'll lose hydroxide leaving an oxyl radical. That oxy radical induces the fragmentation reaction to give you an alkyl radical, losing off an ester. The hydrogen atom donor can then react rapidly with that alkyl radical, providing a hydrogen atom and giving you your alkyl product. That completes the hydrodealkenylation um, reaction and provides the product. Another, I think, interesting thing to note here is the hydrogen atom donor, in this case, is benzene thiol. Uh, and the reason that works is the sulfur hydrogen bond here has a really low bond association energy. I think it's 79 kilocalories per mole, whereas normal CH bonds are around 100 kilocalories per mole. So basically what that means is that the alkyl radical that's formed in situ can abstract that hydrogen relatively easily. So reading through this paper in the mechanistic study when they're kind of describing this reaction, the authors talk about um, doing this reaction under Schreiber conditions. And what they're referring to there is a precedent from Stuart Schreiber all the way back to 1980 using a very similar version of this reaction in a natural products context. So basically, the difference between this paper and that paper, they start with an ozonolysis um, and then they intercept that alpha alkoxy hydroperoxide intermediate that's formed in this paper, they intercept that with uh, a source of iron 2 to get to the oxy radical and then to further fragment that to the carbon-centered radical. So the difference between this paper and that paper is essentially the fate of that carbon-centered radical. So the only terpene that Schreiber applied his conditions to was carbone, where he cleaved off the 1,1 alkene um, of the terpene. Tim Newhouse then um, kind of revived this chemistry recently to apply that same chemistry to, the, to a similar bond cleavage and just greatly expanded the scope of terpenes. In, in the, again, in the idea of you know, kind of applying this towards natural product synthesis. So Schreiber and Newhouse both demonstrated that they could reduce the carbon-centered radical to the alkene, but Quan in this paper intercepts the carbon-centered radical with a hydrogen atom. This idea actually came out of one of her previous papers published in 2018 in ACS Catalysis. Her research group has been focused on making different phosphine catalysts, and in this ACS Catalysis paper, they synthesize their catalysts starting from carbone. So from carbone, they can do a known reaction to form a cyclopentane intermediate, and then from there they can make their catalyst. Because they start with carbone though, this 1,1 disubstituted alkene is carried through to their catalyst. And at first they tried to functionalize this alkene, uh, but they found the best results of their reaction came when this group had more free rotation. So therefore they hypothesized that the substituent uh, was crowding the active face of their catalyst and therefore lowering enantial selectivities. Based on these results, they predicted that cleaving this propenal group would help in their reaction. Um, and looking back through the literature for similar methods, they found the Schreiber and Newhouse precedent of forming this carbon-centered radical, and they thought it might be possible to intercept the radical with a hydrogen atom donor. So they tried it in this paper, and it worked for this transformation and published it in ACS Catalysis. And then from there, we assume they realized the synthetic utility of this transformation and came out with the science paper we're talking about today. So if we want, we can start kind of jumping through some of the, you know, interesting figures that they have throughout this paper and the, the scope that um, the authors of this paper designed. So in table one, they just really start by applying this method to basically all of the examples that they could think of that kind of give some insight into this reaction that have this kind of uh, terminal 1,1 one, one di-substituted alkene um, on some sort of cyclohexane unit. 
So one of the cool examples they highlight like early on in this paper are looking at these bicyclic um, ketones and enones. So if we look at 1E and the enantiomer of 1E, both of these are readily accessible molecules. By doing this transformation or by cleaving this bond, um, you're able to access the weiland meischer ketone, which this pair of enantiomers have been used in over 50 syntheses. And currently, if you were to try to buy this intermediate, they're very expensive. <laughs> this weiland meischer ketone, like you said, Grace, been used in a lot of different natural product total syntheses. Super important. Um, one of the main examples that comes to mind is in Danishevsky's total synthesis of Taxol. Taxol probably being the most important synthetic target in the 20th century. I don't think that's too big of a jump. Other examples that they show are basically they do this transformation on a lot of either naturally occurring terpenes or derivatized terpenes. So looking at like 1K and 1L, they're derived from carvone, which is just a known reaction to get to this point, And then you're able to do this transformation. So, and then kind of looking at 1H, um, which is just menthol, that's about 26 cents per gram. And by cleaving off the 1,1 um, dialkene, you're able to get to reagents that are closer to the order of multiple, you know, thousands of dollars per gram, even to hundreds of thousands of dollars per gram. So all of the compounds that we've talked about so far would fragment to give a uh, secondary carbon radical, but they also show this going through a primary radical intermediate on 1P. Um, so that was an interesting example. Um, so going forward and looking at table two, they then look at exomethylene units, which is just the alkene where the 1,1 one, one substitution is now um, a part of the hexane ring. And so they initially just look at it with, you know, kind of your simplest thing, which would be the um, exomethylene hexane of hexane. Um, and so you, when you cleave this product, you just form the um, methoxy ester of hexane. So yeah, this table highlights that these external alkenes will cleave to give esters. One interesting example here is 3B, which is racemic camphene. That can fragment diastereoselectively selectively to give the cyclopentane carboxylic acid. And then 3C, 3D, and 3E can kind of all be um, blocked into a, a, a similar idea of building complexity through this uh, dealkenylation or the fragmentation reaction. So in 3C, they go from a, um, a bridged bicycle, um, a four-membered ring on the hexane, and by cleaving the alkene, they're able to generate chiral cyclobutane groups, and it is a regioselective. Um, but then they're able to also expand it to fused polycyclic rings of multiple hexanes, as well as you know more elongated rings with cyclobutanes on them as well, building complexity through this fragmentation process. So then in table three, they take these ideas but use um, like internal alkenes, so cyclohexene moieties. So then this gives an aldehyde, um, which they protect. Uh, but it's the same idea of using these bridged bicycles um, to then leave a ring. And so they show a lot of examples of four-membered rings that are now given an anti-selective product. Right. And it, one of the comments that they make, and it's something that uh, we in the Yoon group kind of understand a little bit, um, is this idea that making these uh, chiral cyclobutanes is um, difficult um, through normal means. And so having access to um, natural occurring products that are pretty cheap, so 5B and 5C are both under $5 a gram, that you can then deconstruct into a chiral cyclobutane, which is a important natural product and pharmaceutical product, is super um, useful. One of the things that I noticed when I was reading this paper, or when I was looking at this figure, was the idea that the cyclohexenes map very nicely onto a diels alder reaction. Now the products that they show here um, with the cyclobutanes are not your classic diels alder product, but you could imagine taking a method from this paper out of the natural resource or the, out of the chiral pool and then kind of reusing it in um, artificial synthesis to look at, you know, new ways to kind of bring two products together through a diels alder reaction and then open that ring up and generate linked systems um, that you may not be able to access through your more standard um, reaction uh, toolbox. I think applying this outward like further, you could apply it to other alkenes. So if we start with other uh, like naturally occurring molecules, if you break this like kind of vinyl carbon sp2 carbon sp3 bond and it goes into 
in an angioselective fashion, what other types of complex moieties are you going to end up with? So one of the final things that they show in this paper to really cap off uh, this method and really show its utility is they do some formal syntheses. So basically, uh, they don't do the whole total synthesis, but they use this method to access an intermediate that has been used in a previous total synthesis, but they do it way more efficiently. So the best example of this is a bridge bicycle. In the paper, it's 1V, and this 1V can be made in two steps from R. Carvone. Um, and in the previous total synthesis to access this natural product, they basically took six steps to excise this propenal unit, whereas with this new method, it can be done in one step. And so that's one of the, and some of the, the other uh, formal syntheses that they do, the yields actually end up being slightly lower um, in some of them, but you typically are saving at least two, if not three or four steps, um, as well as you know, four or five purifications. And I think the reduced steps or the reduced yield is not all that significant. So like looking at 1W to form 2W, the yield is an 81% yield versus a 91% yield over five steps. And so I think all of us would take the 10% yield decrease over doing five steps to get to that intermediate. Looking at kind of the last figure that they have in this paper, all they uh, use this last figure for is to really just kind of show that this is a radical mechanism. And then also um, that you can trap, that you don't need to use a hydrogen atom donor to trap this radical. Um, and, you know, kind of as we were imagining with the Diels Alder, as well as, um, you know, other alkenes could be used in this reaction, you know, this again kind of leads you to imagine, you know, the, the power that this reaction could have in generating complexity through deconstruction. For me reading this paper, the, I think the coolest part is just the vision that these authors saw looking at a previous reaction and having kind of the foresight to say this could be really valuable if we just tweak it a little bit and apply it in a new way. We talked about Schreiber coming up with basically a very similar reaction back in 1980, um, but it really wasn't used again for you know a number of years. But they kind of resurrect this reaction. They intercept the carbon-centered radical with the hydrogen atom donor rather than the copper as Schreiber did. And basically in doing so can access all of these incredibly useful chiral starting materials from readily accessible molecules in the chiral pool. I think this paper really is so cool because uh, Schreiber has shown this and Newhouse has expanded this to multiple different terpenes, um, but it really took like a creative mind to see the utility in cleaving this bond, um, where previously they had used it to form an alkene, which can then be further functionalized. Um, but being able to demonstrate the utility of this reaction and see that that's necessary and how it's necessary um, just really stood out in this paper. And that's our show. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Cycle Edition. For more information on the paper discussed, we have included a selection of resources we used in our research at the end of the YouTube video. This was our take on a very interesting paper and we'd love to continue the conversation with you. Please comment below the YouTube video and reach out on social media. You can follow the Cyclo Edition on Twitter and Instagram, where we will post updates about our next episode. You can find the Cyclo Edition wherever you listen to your podcasts and on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. We release episodes every other week, and our next episode will be released on July 8th. We will provide the paper we will be discussing during the next episode in the description of this podcast, as well as on social media a few days before the next episode is released. We hope you tune in on July 8th for our next episode.